But uh, we're, uh, this is being this is was recorded at the same time as the thing you saw some weeks ago, because we have we were able to record images in our uh, civilization. I remember we were very theoretical last time, so now we're going to be uh, as uh, specific and historic as possible. We were attempting to get back, go back to the uh, early America and uh, try to discover the roots and the development of uh, what we would Your today. Your name is? Oh, my name is, uh, and this is, mm, <laughs> and, uh, I'm being, mm, right. Uh, okay. okay. Never mind. And, uh, uh, I'm Tuli, this is Peter Lambon Wilson, and that's Lanny Kenfield behind the camera. Uh, so, uh, we're saying where would you century? want to start? We want to develop uh, what we would today call mm -hmm. anarchist people living or moving toward an anarchist uh, ideal uh, in America. I think we stopped. You said that uh, there was someone in Rhode Island who you uh, thought might be the... All right, but this is going back to the 18th century. <clears throat> he, was an, he was a, an associate and an enemy of Roger Williams. Uh, his name was uh, William Harris. And uh, although the word anarchist was not in use at that time, um, he proclaimed himself to be against all government. And his uh, slogan was, no slaves, no masters. And um, he uh, basically tried to... Uh, when well, he accused Roger Williams of sort of betraying the revolution, in a sense, and engaged in a struggle with Williams and lost. You mean the English Revolution? What revolution? Well, the, the, in the sense that the founding of Rhode Island, you know, to get away from the theocratic okay. tyranny in So where, where, did, he get, a, where did he get his ideas from? Well, it's hard to say. Um, I think he got his idea, but I think that he got his ideas from radical Protestantism. And in fact, radical Protestantism is at the root of almost everything that we think of as the So left. he was a religious person, too, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah. Everybody, up until a certain point, everyone was religious. Right. I mean, heresy is revolution in the context of everything up to the 19th century. So what it's did he... It's only in the 19th century that you get people who can ignore religion. Besides you know. speaking and so on, did he accept <laughs> any institutions? And uh, apparently, what was his fate? <clears throat> apparently he had a few followers among the poor and disenfranchised, but uh, this all evaporated very quickly. Is this in the towns of uh, yeah. Rhode Island? Yeah, and we're talking about um, oh, late 1600s, I suppose. And so uh, Roger Williams opposed him on uh, Roger theological Williams, grounds? Yeah, Roger Williams was a kind of a modern liberal in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. before the fact, just the way Harris was an anarchist mm -hmm. before the fact. So he was very much into government, and he became more conservative. As he, of course, when he came to power in Rhode Island, then he was, you no, know, he was the government. So, so why did, how did William Harris end? He came to a sad end. He went to England to uh, um, escape Roger Williams, and was I'm captured. Sorry. Was captured by <laughs> Islamic right. pirates. You're kidding! And uh, On the high seas, sold yeah. into slavery. It took him years to escape, and he finally escaped and what came a back. Movie. He got all the way back to Rhode Island again, and um, <clears throat> brought a series of lawsuits against uh, Roger Williams, which he uh, lost. A long way for an enemy. Yeah. To go. Exactly, exactly. But you know, he didn't have the uh, advantage of our. So he was captured sight. somewhere near, the, near Africa. And he died in. Uh, yeah, he must have spent several years in, in North Africa and died uh, in poverty and bitterness, you know. Let that be a lesson to all you, uh, William Harris. No, I don't all know. All you, all you anarchists. Harris. No, don't, don't, uh, don't go to sea, uh, uh, <laughs> don't go to sea on an open, and an un no, I don't know what it means. Okay. I don't know, it means that the, the first anarchist was totally lost and forgotten, and is only to be re rediscovered as uh, you generally so how do we know about what Roger Williams' biographers mention him and they make fun of him. You know, they think that he was some, and he was apparently an eccentric and rather so bizarre So he died character. about when? Oh, uh, early? Turn of the century. Yeah, around, you know, in the early 1700s sometime. Wow, okay. So let's... Then we can jump from there, all right? Yeah. We can talk about that. He was an individualist, I would say, mm -hmm. and a sort of precursor of Lysander Spooner and Benjamin Tucker mm -hmm. and all those people. You want to talk about communism, communist yeah. anarchism, we could begin in 1694 
with the commune, uh, the community of the woman in the wilderness in Pennsylvania, founded by a fascinating German uh, uh, named Johannes Kelpius, who was a Rosicrucian and a mystic and an alchemist and an astrologer who thought the world was coming to an end, and for some reason he had to be in the new world when it happened. So what, are, what is this date so, and uh, 1694. what's the town in the... Uh, it's near Germantown. 1694? Yeah, 1694. Mm -hmm. uh, lasted till about 1708. And there was... Uh, anyone could emigrate to the new world then, is that right? Well, if you could organize you it. Could, yeah, I you mean, know, there were no... He had, they had patrons amongst uh, well-to-do German Protestants who, who found So this was British territory by then, wasn't it? It was Penn, William Penn's territory by then, and he had given a grant to some other German pietists, Mennonites, I, I believe, who settled Germantown. And so, so he, when Kelpius arrived, he and his followers went there, but they were strict communists, uh, and uh, held everything in common. And, of course, they expected the world to end any minute. Yeah. So, uh, but they, uh, they, wrote, they did the first dictionary of an American Indian language, uh, brought the first organ to America, and grew the first medicinal herb garden in America. They were very interesting people. And, and uh, uh, the first hymnal, which I'm working on now, uh, a friend of mine is doing the music. We're going to revive some of Kelpius's hymns. Wow. So have, have, been have they been translated? Yeah, they were English? translated by his one English-speaking follower. And uh, are they are the lyrics interest, uh, interesting the or different? The lyrics are interesting. Or trite? Or they're kind of trite. Yeah. And he wasn't a great, you know, genius composer, but they're interesting for the Rosicrucian mysticism mm -hmm. uh, in them, the mentions of Sophia and the feminine principle. She was very. Beautiful. Yeah. Now, why was it called Women in the Wilderness? It's uh, from a line in, in Book of Revelation. But it's also very interesting to compare his, let's say, positive view of the feminine principle with the Puritans, who were around at the same time, who were uh, talked about the uh, the city on the hill was as their image, you know, that the wilderness was evil to them, mm -hmm. and to Kelpius it seemed to be good. The feminine was evil to the Puritans. To Kelpius, it seemed to be a principle of good. So was there a liberal kind of sexual policy in the Well, as a matter of fact, these particular people were celibate. That's pretty liberal. Yeah, it's either it's <laughs> no radical. Prob no radical. problem. Anyway, I don't so know. So how many people were in this uh, group? Forty. Forty? Yeah, the mystical. And, and how long did it last? It lasted until about 1708. Kelpius died young because he uh, spent too much time out in his cave uh, doing alchemical experiments. Was and, he after uh, gold? Mm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So, I doubt it. I think he was after enlightenment. So uh, it, did it uh, end after he died? Is that no, it, it dragged on for a few years, and then it had a big inspiration on a on another German pietist communist group called Amana, I think. Mm -hmm. Is it Amana? Yeah, that's still uh, which, which survived well right. into the 20th century. So I mean, a the, there's still a product. The product yeah. uh, is still a descendant of their industry. The town, yeah, which yeah, that's right. Where is that? Well, they eventually ended up in the Midwest in somewhere. In Indiana, I yeah. think, maybe. Didn't but they're, they're sort of direct descendants of Kelpius. It's interesting. So, um, was there a specific reason for the breakup? Uh, the world didn't come to an end. I see. Oh, well, that you happens know? often, <laughs> it doesn't happened, it? It yeah. happens often, yeah. And then the people just disappeared. They just into sort of disappeared. Yeah, mm -hmm. they faded away. Yeah, but it, it had a good long run from 94 to 08. Well, it's uh, long for a twelve commune, years, maybe. long for a commune, know. compared to Brook Farm, maybe, but not really. Yeah. So then the Germans kept coming over, right? The Germans kept coming and over, and they were the center of the. They, they were all. They were most of, of the communist movement. Yeah. Were there any indigenous? Uh, this or is before Marx, you're talking. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Well, let's see. What do we mean, indigenous? Were there any Bri uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, communist movement? Paleo yeah. Indian. Se. Well, yeah, there were people who sort of ran away and became Indians, if you know what I mean. It's oh, Roanoke, huh? Roanoke is a, a wonderful example. It's the one I usually, uh, Croatan, you know, gone to Croatan. When, uh, but that's even earlier. That's right? even earlier, 1607. Now, is, 16, this, no, is, there, is this speculation? No, it's 1584. Or in your, in your uh, opinion, uh, like the, it's been disputed that they... Uh, that they were all killed, but you, you... They weren't all killed. Some of them were killed. They had a war with uh, Powhatan, 
Uh, but they also had allies amongst the Croatan and other tribes. And they, um, this is almost now accepted by most historians. Uh, the ones who uh, didn't, who didn't uh, uh, fall in the war with, with Powhatan okay. left Roanoke and went to Croatan and then later removed inland into the Great Dismal Swamp, okay, so, all right, where so they still are. And they're, 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 they're uh, called the Croatan Indians to this day. And they, they still have the family names. Do they still live in any kind of uh, institutions that are like 17th or 18th century, or, th or have they been uh, debased into uh, our culture? I would, you know, these these groups are called in sociology, they're called tri-racial isolate communities, uh -huh. and that means black, white, and red. Right. And um, I find them fascinating. And but I are, think they, there is they're more, are they more like Americans than they are like Indians, like the 17th century Indians? They held on to a tribal and, let's say, Indian mentality for, for a long, long time and still have a great deal of it. And in the 1970s, all of these groups had an awakening of consciousness thanks to the American Indian movement. Yeah. And they all tried to get tribal status. Did they? And they all failed. Because they're be too expensive down. to the uh, well, American you know, government. The BIA figured, the Bureau of Indian Affairs figured that if they let these people become yeah. tribes, the next thing would be the hippies, you know, and they'd have to let the hippies form tribes well, and have reservations. Yeah. So uh, they turned them down, and it was very disappointing and right. very angry, you know, they, they became very angry about the whole, it was very right. sad. What, uh, w uh, w we could go, we, we could... This guy has knows too much. All right, we, yeah. all right. Let me ask you one other question we're before to we get to the we, before we detach from this. <laughs> if these people were, you say they reverted to being Indian, uh, the Western Europeans, the yes. British mostly, right? Now, one, that's all very say, romantic. A wonder, wonderful quote from from I think it was, it wasn't Cotton Mather, but it was some late later historian, uh, uh, Puritan uh, apologist, who said. The thing he couldn't understand is there were hundreds of, of examples of white men becoming Indians, but no examples of Indians embracing the white man's way. Well, there was an attempt in uh, New England, you know, uh, in the 17th century. Uh, Harvard, for instance, uh, enrolled a few Indians oh, yeah, no, in Dartmouth were College. There were attempts. later on, of course, but up until about well, uh, no, that was up until about century. 1700. There were damn few examples. But there were, there were attempts, and there were some people. The, the guy I'm trying to think of his name now. The uh, Indian there were a few Christianized was, Indians. Yeah, but, well, there uh, were a lot, and, but, uh, but they, they ended usually up didn't, getting... But they didn't give up their tribal economy. Uh, King William's, was it not King, King Philip's War. <laughs> right. Uh, involved, Lonnie, Lonnie's getting tired involved, of involved, uh, the 19th century. <laughs> involved this Indian. Yeah, yeah, we, were, we got stuck okay. in the colonialism. All right, but I want to make one more question, but okay. I just want a short answer, and then we want to jump right. ahead. Okay. Now, it was very, it was very romantic, and I could see myself even trying to do this back to the Indians, but were the Indian institutions anything uh, uh, closely related to what you would call, what we would call anarchist institutions? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, all right. We'll discuss that. We'll absolutely. pursue that some other time. They were all right, not, so now the Germans are coming to mostly to Pennsylvania. Actually, let's skip ahead because we did all that colonial stuff to a certain extent. All right. I would, I would, I'd like but to. I mean, there were many. Lonnie brought up the term utopianism last time, yeah. and I'd like to get off on that with your permission. In uh, America, though? Yeah, in America. Not Fourier. Well, Fourier is very relevant to America. Yeah, but we're going to discuss Fourier in the whole program. Oh, so, I thought this was it. No. Oh. Right. No, we're okay. not doing the all Fourier. Right. No, all we right. want to do the anarchist movement. That, we all might right. still do another. Oh, right. okay. So we should go. Now, why were the Germans leaving? Couldn't they do this in Germany? Obviously not, huh? There was, uh, there was a certain amount of persecution of these extreme pietist sects. By whom? by Lutherans, where the Lutherans were in power, and by mm -hmm. Catholics, where the Catholics were All right, were in so power. they were like probably dozens of These people of these. were accused of being Anabaptists, mm -hmm. which, as you know, in 1525, the great Anabaptist uprisings in Germany were put down by Luther, not by the, not by the Catholic Church, but Luther had the Anabaptists wiped were, out. Were they like peasant uprisings? They were, yeah, these, these were the left-wing peasants who were far more radical than Luther ever dreamed, you know. So and they were using religion to uh, assert their kind of class, class interest, equality. Yeah, of yeah. course, class equality, right. All right. So Marx, th Marx and Engels were very enamored. They liked that. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they came here, like, were there, at, at their height, were there like 30 or 50 of these colonies in the, in the early eight, 19th century? Or? 
There were a lot of Germans, them. just Germans and yeah. northern Protestant types. A lot. Hard yeah. to and say. mostly in Hundreds Pennsylvania, right? Spread all over the map, except mm -hmm. the south. And uh, they still sort of exist. No, among I take the, that back. They were even in the south. They still sort of. Uh, what's the term I want to use now for the? They're still around. The Pennsylvanians, the uh, Amish the people. Yeah, the Amish. They're they sort of. Yeah, they? well. They're not one of the more communistic or, or, or non-hierarchical 15 minutes we got to win. We have half a show minutes. here. Uh, all right. <laughs> so all right. So let's uh, jump right ahead. Go back to the. Let's go to the to the Spooner and the individualist anarchists who are developing. All right. Anyway, at the same my, time, my right? point is that radical Protestantism slowly, slowly develops into the mid 19th century reform movement, which in America is still almost 100 percent Protestant. If you look at people like Garrison, the great abolitionist, for example, mm -hmm. who was also an anarchist, or at John Humphrey Noyes and the perfectionists of Oneida, mm -hmm. or uh, almost all of the reformers talked a line of radical Protestant Christianity. Right. And t to me, if you examine leftism today, you find, you know, the, the debris of Protestantism all over the floor. Uh, leftism's tendency to be moralistic, for example. I trace directly back to this process. What do you mean, uh, sexually moralistic? Yeah, I do. You mean Puritan? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I do. Well, I'll tell you, in American, in American CP, that uh, had a Hasidic component. Mm. Who were also be, uh, my grandparents were, uh, and my parents were the most, most sexually repressed people I know. Yeah, well, the Protestants, it were pro Protestant radicals were always great Judaizers. They were always pro-Jewish, you know. So they picked up on a lot of that. Uh, well, what's uh, what are some of the groups in the strong the 19th morality. century? Like, well, one be like, pick a group. well, uh, I'd say two of the most interesting groups would be the perfectionists that I just mentioned. Uh, this on is the one Oneida. Hand, Oneida, on Oneida. On the one hand, Lake, upstate New York. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And the other set of interesting groups. Silver. Would, there were silversmiths. We, we could compare them. Yeah. Uh, we could compare them with the Fourierists, who were not particularly religious. Uh, so, for example, all right, Noyes started out as a radical Protestant. He came to the conclusion that human beings could be perfected even now on Earth, that, so to speak, the Second Coming had already happened, and it was now possible for, for humankind to achieve perfection. It, was, it had come without a Christ? Uh, he felt that there was a spiritual Christ that existed in all people who had come I to know, you know, the, the mystical That's truth, really coming. A kind of inner, yeah, a kind of inner Christ experience that was for him tantamount to the second coming. And the upshot of it was economic communism and sexual communism for them. They were into uh, group marriage uh, in the sense that every male and every female was m potentially married within the group and um, he felt that exclusive uh, exclusivism in love was as bad as pri as, as uh, privacy and so property. So Fourier, right? Or no, Fourier was not as much of a communist as, as I mean in the sexual noise, thing. But he certainly believed in, in uh, orgyism okay. as a way of life. It's secular. This is why we like Fourier. I mean, Fourier so, was the most sex positive of all, all right. the great reformers. So, uh, noise. This is what eventually brought down the wrath of the community on the, on the, yeah. of the outside community on noise and yeah, broke free, up. Yeah, free love is always what broke it up. It's what yeah. broke up modern times in Long Island. Uh, no, I mean the either, outside. Either the fire outside. or free love put an end to all of the. The outside communion. community uh, resented it and was jealous of it. Yeah, and also there was some. If you can believe it, there were some problems there with people who wanted to be uh, uh, monogamous with each other. No, there was very, well, very few problems. Well, there Actually, were a few people, amazing, they had to leave. Amazing how <laughs> few people left uh, Oneida. Really, to me, it's astonishing because what they were doing, you know, they were practicing coitus reservatus, uh, where the men would not supposedly have orgasms. Uh, and so as to uh, birth control and also so that women could have could have orgasms, which were apparently quite rare in the 19th century, and women were absolutely crazy about. Uh, well, were the men allowed to ejaculate outside of the? Uh, uh, this is, you know, it's a great mystery because they couldn't actually s discuss these things so openly in their printed really? work, and you. Have a historian, but there must be. As a historian, you have to depend on rumor, on oral tradition. 
and I'm not even sure I should say these things on, on, in the public media. I do know some things about what their sexual practices were, but I'm not sure that it would say, well, you can tell be a good me. thing to, uh, to broach their privacy, even at this late date. Why? It's okay. important to know physic physiologically right. I'm what not happens gonna, to people right. who inhibit the okay. males who are aroused and inhibit their orgasm. Uh, I'm not going to tell you where orgasm this information have a lot of problems, I'll tell you that. One would it's think in, so. It's involved, supposedly it's one of, it, it's one of the things that's involved in... Uh, From the Reichian point of uh, view, it's... Pr prostatism in, uh, among men. Yeah. The, I'm not going to tell you where I, where I heard this, but I've heard that the secret of Oneida was oral sex. Okay. Uh, not, not coitus reservatus. Officially, it was coitus reservatus. But well, that's, uh, uh, the that's very economical, too. Yeah. Then they also practiced, we were talking last time about, um, or actually between shows we were talking about um, Do you believe that that's, breeding that programs. that's true? What I mean, mean, what's true? That it was oral sex? I think there's probably a lot of truth okay. to that, yeah. Okay. However, they, they did uh, produce children. They just wanted to plan them. Right. And they had a very interesting course of planned birth, uh, a kind of a genetic, almost kind of eugenic idea, which has now fallen into such a uh, bad reputation because the Nazis picked it up, mm -hmm. eugenics. But Noyes' idea was very innocent and, did, and positive. Did he proselytize a lot? Or? He, mm, yes, did he, he did. He was a, a very, there were a few colonies or just one? There were a few. Mm -hmm. Oneida was the main one and the only one that survived. And is now, as you pointed out, still existing as a, uh, uh, as a silverware company. They, when they, they gave up free love, and then they gave up communism, and they and, gave up and, all kinds of things. And he but left to Canada still... because he was afraid he was going to be uh, yeah. thrown into jail. Yeah, yeah. Then, then uh, since we only have seven minutes left, Fourier, is, <laughs> is the Fourier, American Fourierists are interesting because they tried to do something very similar without religion. And, uh, or at least in most cases. In Brook Farm, we see the two traditions mm -hmm. came together. That's what's interesting about Brook Farm. They started out as radical Protestants and perfectionists with ideas very close to noise, except on sex. Have they actually read his works? No, mm -hmm. I don't think they so. They didn't use the word noise, no, noise came later. Oh. Noise so came a little later. This, what's the time frame for, for Oneida? Well, it, it's all from the 1830s to the 1850s, you know. It's all squeezed into about 20 years, all of this stuff. It's amazing. It's just like the 1960s. In fact, we were talking about how there is no new age, and there was, you know, the 1960s was just an archaeological layer on top of the 1840s, and all the old ideas were still circulating, you know, amongst us early hippies without knowing it. We were the heirs of the of the 1840s. So uh, um, the the exact chronology is uh, noise outlasted the Fourierists. And he wrote the wonderful book, American Utopia, American Socialism. Is that in print? I've been looking yeah, for it. Yeah, Dover keeps it in print under oh, the name good. of Strange Sects and Utopias oh, good. I or can something. Oh, get it for half price, maybe. Uh, so, so Noyes had some very interesting criticisms to make of Fourierism. He was very sympathetic to it. He liked the free love aspect of it. He just said that he thought that religion was a necessary component of a successful commune. And when you actually examine the history, yeah. he, he, he looks to be correct. Yeah. Um, the longest lasting Fourierist uh, commune was the new, uh, the uh, North American phalanx over in, uh, in Red, Red Bank, Bank, New Jersey, lasted 13 years. That was the longest. Yeah. Um, whereas some of the uh, religious communist uh, communes have lasted hundreds of years. Hundreds of years, you know, and if permanence is your value, which it isn't for me well, necessarily. No, it isn't. You know, because we have to examine what the real life two is. Two years of mean, two years of, of, of real life Stalin is Stalin was also a kind of a communist. You know, two two minutes of real life yeah. is worth is worth years of boredom. Um, so uh, two thousand years of Catholicism. So did the four, the Fourierists in America? Did they link up with they link, linked up with people in the cities? Were they drawing people from the uh, from from, from the country? Yeah, they did. As a matter of fact, uh, were they getting industrial workers? They got more agricultural workers than industrial workers because Fourier himself was not very positive about modern industry. He was mm -hmm. more interested in agriculture. He but I mean, they, they were viable because they had either a product or some way of 
Well, look, if you look, for example, economically viable, other than their religious or when or the North American broke up, beliefs. when the North American broke up, they paid a dividend. They had been so successful. When the, when the Wisconsin phalanx broke up, they paid a profitable dividend. People came out with more than so. They were they in. manufacturing things? Do they do have small handcrafts, or they were agricultural mostly? You know, noise makes a joke about how uh, every one of them had a uh, uh, what do you call a place where you handle where you do wood? You know, um, handicraft uh, workshop. Well, a uh, 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 lumber mill. Uh -huh. You know, and they all they all at least had a lumber mill. So did but most of them did. Most uh, the, the successful ones were successful more in agricultural produce. But but were there like people come from like Philadelphia or New York immigrants who couldn't make it there and go to this place? Of course, you had a certain uh, class of what we were you know hel helpless dropouts who got involved in these movements from the city. Yeah, people who were pretty useless. And the in fact, you know Owen, yeah. New Harmony where they had an open admission policy. Don't call them useless. They couldn't get along because they well, couldn't, they, they couldn't you, eat you all read that the, shit. You read, right. the, you read the history of, of New Harmony. There were some pretty useless people who got in. Yeah, and but the, not as useless as the head of American Express. No. Oh, please, no. But, I mean, uh, New Harmony was a mess compared to, uh, say, the North American. And the agricultural people, were they farm owners or were they farm? Yeah, the New Harmony, uh, actually, Owen came over in the 40s and bought uh, Harmony, Indiana, from the Rappites, which were one of the German communist groups who had built a nice little town and said, okay, we've done that, and they wanted to move farther west. So they sold a whole already existing town to Owen, and he still couldn't make a go of it. It only lasted a few years. Or it was a the, mess. The Fourierists, the agricultural people, who went, were they farm owners or were they farm laborers? Like, what class did they come from? Would they would generally tend to have come from failed small farmers, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I a, see. a lot of that. And, and um, city people, you know, shoemakers, uh, watchmakers, people like that who, who mm -hmm. wanted to get, just like in the 60s when we wanted to all get back to the land. There was right. a very similar feeling there back to the land uh, movement was getting underway. So were they undercapitalized or what were, why did they fail? Uh, many of them failed because of they were land poor. They, they, this back to the land, and, and again, the same thing happened in the 1960s. They got a lot of land and, you know, they had all, they spent all their money on land and then they didn't have enough capital to get the thing going. And don't overlook the incompetence. Incompetence had a lot to do with it. The successful ones, including Brook Farm, the Wisconsin, and the North American, failed uh, either because of fire, in the case of Brook Farm and the North American, there were One disastrous minute. fires that, uh, unfortunately, they couldn't survive. And uh, in other cases, the experiment came to an end. The, none of, some of these things were not meant to last forever. And this is yeah, a very important Yeah, we want to know point. why, though. The, the Brook Farm, I know... Uh, Brook Farm would have lasted never, if it hadn't been for the fire. Never did well economically. The, the, their main source the, of income was their the school. school. And the yeah. school was doing very well. Interestingly enough, Owen's But they were all so. undercapitalized, I think. Yeah, they were all undercapitalized, and Fourier would have criticized them for that. Yeah. Okay, well, we're going to discuss Fourier by himself on his own program. He's going to be with us. <laughs> I'll channel him. <laughs> yeah, and our next uh, show. All right. And our next well, show, we'll, we'll, get, speak for we'll act finally for get, finally get to the 20th century, maybe too. Well, I don't know. But we don't uh, well. Want to rush you.